Good evening. I am Danielle Harvey, the Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations. And on behalf of the USC Alumni Association, I want to welcome you all to our USC Alumni Entrepreneurs Network Spring Program, Industry Game Changer, a conversation with David Mignon. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our esteemed alumni speakers for this evening's program. Since March 2019, David has served as CarParts.com's Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer. Under David's leadership at CarParts.com, the company has undergone a comprehensive operational turnaround with record financial growth. David has become a recognized leader in e-commerce, having led the transformation of CarParts.com at the organizational, logistical, and financial level. David is a double Trojan with a BS in accounting and a master of business taxation. We are also joined by our moderator for this conversation, Dennis Yu. Dennis is a revenue leader within the e-commerce technology industry with over 15 years of experience creating business strategies and overseeing growth functions and managing teams for companies from startups to large corporations. He is currently the merchant success team leader at Shopify under the revenue team that empowers entrepreneurs and makes commerce better for everyone. Dennis received his master's degree from the executive MBA program at USC in 2017. And I am now going to turn our program over to Dennis. Thank you all again. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, first of all, it's such an honor for me to be invited back to USC to moderate this fireside chat with a fellow Trojan, a Trojan who's had an impressive career and continues to make great impact in the business world. Uh, with that being said, let's get started. Hi, David. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. So good to have you back at USC. Hey, Dennis. How you doing? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think... The audience here would love to hear a little bit more about your background and uh, your personal journey. So if you could just start by giving us some background on your career and how you came about taking on the role of COO slash CFO of carparts.com. Yeah, sure. I'll give you kind of the brief, uh, brief 30 second version. But, you know, I, I was born in France, uh, moved to the United States when I was 17, uh, went to community college and then was lucky enough to attend USC. Uh, both for my undergrad and my graduate degree. So I'm, uh, like Danielle said, I'm a double Trojan. Uh, started in public accounting as a CPA, ended up doing a lot of different things, uh, practicing in public accounting, uh, started my own company in the beverage space, uh, started a few companies under the umbrella of the Coca-Cola company. I was responsible for their startup accelerator. Uh, and then two years ago, I had the pleasure, the opportunity, and uh, really the luck of joining one of the most exciting companies out there right now, uh, carparts.com. And, and the last two years have been really fantastic. Yeah, no, that, that sounds really exciting. I mean, when I look at your background, it's, um, it's very interesting and very dynamic, right? Um, like you mentioned, you were from financial investment to real estate to entrepreneurship and now running an online business that's, that's publicly traded. Um, how does each experience help you get to where you are today? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, all of these experiences uh, helped. You know, it's, it's definitely been a journey. I think that the common thread has been, you know, thinking and having the mindset of an owner-operator. Owner I think I never took on a job as like a traditional quote-unquote employee. I just, I made it my own. And whether it was real estate or public accounting or starting my own company or working under the Coke umbrella, it was always like, hey, this is my business. I'm responsible for it. Like, what can I do to grow this business? And, you know, the last two years at carparts.com, I'm lucky enough that it, it is my business. Uh, um, but um, yeah, I think that's been the common thread. It's owner operator mindset. Sure. And I think a lot of people now talk about, you know, entrepreneurship when they look for certain jobs in the company. Companies obviously have listed out in, the, in their requirement, uh, job requirements well. Um, what, what does that mean to you? And, and perhaps you can share a little bit about 
um, is that also a requirement when you look to hire uh, another leader for your company in terms of having that entrepreneurial entrepreneur spirit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, entrepreneurial spirit for me is that that owner owner operator mentality. Um, you know, regardless of the size of the company, regardless of the business uh, that that you're in or the industry, and kind of connecting the dots between that mindset and customer experience. You know, ultimately, you know, the way I think about it is the customer pays the bills. Uh, you know, you're in the business mm -hmm. of selling something, whether it's auto parts in in my case or services. So when I was in public accounting. I was responsible or, you know, I was expected to sell a service when I was in real estate, I was selling, you know, uh, you know, ownership or leasing space, or I was selling buildings. When I was in the beverage industry, I was serving a customer and selling drinks. So, you know, ultimately is how do you connect the dots between being an owner operator and then uh, solving a customer need? Right, right, right. I think that that goes very much in line with what everybody talks about, especially in technology business, when people say customer centric or or merchant centric, um, as you just mentioned. So um, along your career journey, have you had anyone who had a memorable impact uh, on your career that's helped you as a mentor and get to where you are? And, you know, if you do, I'd love to kind of hear some stories because everybody talks about that so much, right? The importance of having mentorship or somebody that really impacted the career. Um, kind of love to hear your, 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 your end of the story. Yeah, I think it, it's always hard to pick like one, one person or one event. Um, you know, when, when I moved to the United States, I didn't speak English, so I made it a point to, to read as much as I could. And I think I got a lot of, of valuable information and valuable advice from, you know, business leaders that I've never met. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people that have worked for me, people that I've worked for, my bosses, my boss's boss, my partners, my investors. I think if I had to pick one that stands out that I use on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, a, a guy, a friend of mine who's become a close friend of mine, his name is Robert Macias. So he was my co-founder uh, four years ago. You know, him and I started a trade, like a retail execution company, a merchandising company. And what he told me is, and he was a veteran from Coke that spent 40 years at the Coca-Cola company. And he told me everything that matters happens on the floor of the store. And so I took that on, you know, for the rest of my career, for the next last four years, everything that matters happens on the floor of the office. Everything that matters happens on the floor of the DC. Everything that matters doesn't happen behind a desk. So my job mm -hmm. is not to sit behind a desk looking at spreadsheets and, and dreaming. It's visiting our people, visiting our distribution centers, visiting our vendors, talking to our investors and having that face-to-face -face communication, looking for opportunities. So you know, today I run a big supply chain. Nothing mm -hmm. happens looking at spreadsheets or a WMS dashboard. It happens by talking to the folks that are unloading the containers, packing the boxes. You know, last week I had the opportunity to visit uh, our Texas facility for the second time this month. And I get so much out of it by interacting with our people, watching the process, watching how the, the product flows. Everything that matters happens on the floor of the DC. That's, that's uh been a fantastic lesson for me. I love that. Um, really, it's really understanding your customer at its core, right? Or, or your employees in the day to day. Um, as the company grows um, and your, your leadership position, obviously, now your employee count grows, how do you usually balance the time of, you know, getting into sort of the day to day um, and also running some, some of the sort of high level strategic sessions? Because um, obviously, everybody only, only has so much time uh, within a day. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And it's actually something that we've been going through um, for the last six months. I know two years ago, we, we joined the company that was you know, in financial distress and we executed a, a transformation and a turnaround. And for the first 18 months, it was very, very tactical. Uh, so there was a lot of blocking and tackling. And now we're taking on a new phase of growth for the company and we have to be a lot more strategic. So you know, the way I address it and the way our teams address it is you know, we block off time on our calendar multiple times a week to step away from the business. So the way we do it is we don't do it in a conference room, no phones, no laptops, just a whiteboard. And we just, just we talk about the long-term vision of the company. We talk about what is it, what it is that we're solving, what the customer needs, what's the vision, what's the values that we want to at our core. And then no blocking and tackling, no metrics. Like, so it's really putting on that hat of like, what does the customer need? And how do we build a business long-term that can address those needs? 
but really you have to block off time off your calendar. Otherwise, you know, I'm not able to do it. I can't juggle between ta tactical and strategic. I have to make the time to, to think about that. Right, right. So intentionality really, really matters here. Yeah. Um, and let's shift gear a little bit to, to the business itself. Um, so, so for those who are not familiar with carparts.com, can you start by sharing some background about the company? Yes. And now I'm, you're getting me excited because I love talking about <laughs> carparts.com. Like, I don't want to talk about myself. I, I want to talk about what we're doing for sure. So, you know, interesting enough, you know, the, the company was founded 25 years ago. We started as a local distributor uh, selling lights to body shops. And we were the first company to sell auto parts online. Um, and then over time, we became a bigger and bigger player. Uh, you know, for the last 10 years, the company was pretty flat. You know, our sales kind of hovered around 300 million between 250 and 300 million dollars uh, as the industry kept growing and growing. And today we are the fastest growing and the number one destination for finding auto parts online. Uh, you know, our run rate is higher than half a billion dollars. We've doubled the size of the business over the last two years and, and we're becoming that number one destination for, for auto parts. That's, that's very, very impressive. And I imagine even, and this is just a wild guess, were there any other competitor in that space online uh, when you guys launched your company? And yeah. if so, how, how did you navigate that sort of competitive uh, landscape? Yeah, and, and now we're getting into what makes our company unique. And yeah, there's a few players out there uh, that sell auto parts online. Um, a lot of them are marketplaces or um, marketplaces or drop shippers. And what makes us very unique is that we have our own supply chain. So we have our own sourcing capabilities, our own distribution network. Today, we operate five distribution centers, close to a million square feet. And we source the parts from, from globally, whether it's Mexico, Korea, Taiwan, China, we bring them into our distribution centers and then we ship them directly to the customer. So what that does is we can have the same quality parts as all the premium brands, but we can have them for a fraction of the price because we have that you know, two-step distribution model. So there's, only, there's no one touching the product except us. It goes from factory to us, from us to the customer. So you get the same product for half the price and there's no one else that can do that. Right, no, no, that's, that's, uh, that's, very, that's very interesting and impressive. I know a lot of direct consumer models also were built on supply chain. Um, since you had mentioned your background was in accounting and investment as well, um, where does that mindset of understanding that supply chain could be this sort of differentiator for your business? Yeah, I think, you know, financial discipline is definitely one of our, our core pillar. Uh, we like to say that we have three pillars as we execute on the strategy, operational excellence, financial discipline, and outstanding customer experience. I think everything I've done in the last 15 years was kind of a version of that. I think the job is bringing everyone, every one of those pillars together and aligning the strategy and making sure that everyone on the team, you know, has the same mindset. Uh, obviously, easier said, easier said than done, but... Uh, that's the ultimate vision. Right, I mean, that, that's great. And, and if I can double click on that, and I may, may be a little bit more selfish here since I'm in merchant success. So customer success is a sort of a, it lives in my heart. Um, so could you, when you were talking about customer success, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, customer experience and customer success, what does that look like, you know, at carparts.com? And perhaps if you, even if you can give some examples of the story, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, it's really the overarching principle of the company. And you know, what we're, the way we approach it is it, it has to trickle down to all our core competencies. Uh, so you know, we have what we think are core competencies, supply chain, technology, marketing, uh, data and catalog, um, and customer experience as a whole. And so on the supply chain standpoint, it means shipping the right product as quickly as possible and making sure that the customer gets it as quickly as possible. So. If you think about Amazon, you know, every day I show up to my house and I have packages and packages of Amazon. Sometimes I, f I forget what I bought and I forget, did I really need it today or, uh, you know, next day? But, you know, that's the standard. The standard is you order something online and you want to get it next day. So customer experience starts with getting the right product immediately, as quickly as possible, especially in our business, because, you know, we sell a need, not a want. So our customer wants to get back on the road. They have an issue with their car. They come to us for that solution, and we have to deliver that solution incredibly quickly. You know, technology, you want to have a site that's easy to use, that's fast, where you can find the right product for your car. So we ask you to put in your year, make, model, and then we, we kind of deliver that curated selection similar to a brick-and-mortar location. 
hey, I have a 2008 Toyota Corolla. I need a left headlight. So you type that in, like, this is the headlight that you need. So we're not going to give you 150 different choices. We're going to give you that one that is guaranteed to fix your car. So this is kind of how we think about it. You start with what is it, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And how does that translate into all the pillars and the core competencies of your business? And, and how, how does technology, well, you have mentioned in terms of shipping, supply chain is being sort of one of the value propositions and also that obviously rolls up the customer experience as well. Um, what, uh, can you share a little bit, of, can you share a little bit about the technology itself, whether it's, you know, uh, artificial intelligence or discovery or, or any sort of algorithm to better customize, you know, that, uh, product that you guys suggest? Um, what does that play into the strategy business-wise for you? Yeah, so that's a great point. You know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, that's definitely a big push that we've been having over the last two years. So we built a data science team with multiple PhDs. Uh, I actually hired three Trojans over the last two years from the, the, the data science department and the computer science department. So obviously I'm biased, but um, yeah, you know, what order goes where and for what reason, you know, when the customer buys, you know, two items or three items, are we gonna ship it from the same DC? Are we going to ship it in the same box? Uh, you know, how do you how do you think about customer experience? Uh, it, like order orchestration is what we call it. That's a big component. And then anything that happens inside the warehouse, once the order goes through the warehouse, like how do we make sure that it goes out the door as quickly as possible? So you know, we have click to ship reporting. So the clock we like to say the clock starts as soon as the customer gives us their credit card information. The clock starts. And the goal is for me to get the order out of the building within 12 hours or less. And once it's out of the building, to make sure that they get it the next day or two days later. They say like that click to delivery mentality is critical. So you start with what's the problem I'm trying to solve? I'm trying to get the part that they need as quickly as possible. And how do I build the technology in the process to make sure that happen? So click to ship, ship to delivery. Right. Do, do you think we'll ever get to get to the point? I know certain countries now, they, the last mile delivery become very, very important. Uh, it really depends on the product, depends on, you know, how soon the customers want it. But the fact is the trend is going towards, if I can just click and somehow get the product in an hour, that would be the, the goal. Is that how you guys also look at your customer needs as well? Is that the trend that you're going towards? So we're, you know, we're always trying to get, you know, shorter delivery times, but I think sure. what we have to remember is that short delivery time and last mile delivery has a cost and ultimately the customer has to pay that cost. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for us, some of our customers are pretty price sensitive. Like if you want, if you want a part immediately, if you need a battery, you can go to a brick and mortar location and pay double the price. Now, if you're not as sensitive to time and you can wait one day, we can sell you the same part and you get it for 50% le less, 50% uh, discount. So the question is, do you need it immediately? And if yes, are you willing to pay a premium for that? Some customers are, some customers aren't. Right, right. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that let's shift a little bit about the, the growth of the company. And like you mentioned, the company's grown quite fast um, in such a short time. So um, what, what, over the years, what's been the hardest part of scaling your company? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of things that you have to do to scale a business. I think for us is thinking about all components and all parts of the company moving together as a system. You know, we inherited a business that had been around for 23 years and we decided to take it in a different direction. So making sure that, you know, the supply chain aligns with the marketing, the marketing aligns with the technology, the technology aligns with, you know, the data, the, the business intelligence and, and moving everything together as a system as you're rebuilding the team, um, but we have a fantastic team and it's been working, you know, our business has more than doubled. Um, but it also started with, you know, making investments. I think you can't cut your way to success. We like to say, so, you know, you come into a business that's been, uh, you know, in distress. And I think the gut reaction is like, hey, let me cut costs. And we took mm -hmm. the opposite approach. It's like, Hey, let's shift some of the resources. And instead of spending in this bucket, we'll spend in this bucket. But at the same time, like, let's, let's create a catalyst and invest in the business. Let's invest in talent. Let's, in, let's invest in inventory. Let's invest in supply chain, open up more DCs. And, and that's been working really well for us. Yeah, that's fantastic. You guys, it sounds like you guys took more of a sort of innovative and growth approach as opposed to cost cutting, like you said, um, and, and when you guys stepped in. Um, I assume 
car parts in general as an industry, there's a lot of sort of antiquated tools and also best practices. Uh, as you mentioned, your, your approach is much more innovative. In different buckets you mentioned, um, what, which bucket did you guys look at as, well, this is where we really want to make the bets at the very beginning. And, and how, how did that turn out? Or was it, was you guys have to make further pivots from there? Yeah, you know, originally we came into the business and we decided to look at basically every bucket. Uh, you know, we've made investments and changes in, in all buckets. You know, I think the main mm -hmm. one are, you know, historically we operated 17 different websites. Uh, so there was no real vision, no real, you know, like it's really hard to manage one website as it is managing 17 different websites with seven different, 17 different pricing levels and strategies. So consolidating everything and putting all our time and effort and resources and like that, the, the mind share to carparts.com, uh, that was a big plus. Second is, you know, we're a supply chain company too. So getting close to the customer was really important. Uh, so two years ago, we had two distribution centers. Today we have five. And the goal is for us to get to 80% of our customers within one day. And I think the number three was historically, we've been very driven by replacement parts and collision parts. So that's everything that goes outside the car. Now the total addressable market for that is big, but it's not as big as mechanical parts. So brakes, mm. steering, suspension, and all that, that's a huge market. That's a $250 billion market. So expanding that assortment to start selling brakes and shocks and struts and control arms. So we can become that number one destination, regardless of what you need. If you need a, uh, you know, a headlight, a taillight, a bumper cover, we have that. If you need steering, suspension, brake pads, we have that too. And we're the only company that can actually do that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about just the past, past now, you know, since March, uh, the pandemic time. Um, I know supply chain has been under the spotlight where, you know, even a lot of people that were not aware of what supply chain is. And now they understand once they couldn't get the toilet paper they wanted, um, they know the, the importance of supply chain. So um, can you share just uh, some, some learnings or even some stories during this time? What, what did you guys do at the very beginning of pandemic? And what was the mindset in terms of what you guys had to do in terms of business and, and what was the outcome? Yeah, I mean, this supply chain is definitely a, a key factor. And, you know, I think it's impacted a lot of retailers and we're a retailer too. Um, you know, the, the first two weeks of the pandemic were a little scary. Um, I think we did a pretty good job at, you know, staying calm. And uh, we made it a point to over communicate with our people, our investors, our lenders, our vendors, like, hey, this is what's going on. This is the impact on the business. And this is what we're doing to manage it. Uh, so we're going to keep executing on the roadmap. We're going to keep our people safe, uh, but at the same time, we're going to put together, uh, you know, plan Bs and plan Cs. If this happens to sales, this is what we're going to do. If this happens to sales, this is what we're going to do. So we had a lot of contingency scenarios, and as we got more and more information, we, we just kept executing on the roadmap. Um, you know, we were lucky that we basically, we had loaded up on inventory before the pandemic. Our business was up 45% year over year pre-pandemic. So we were in a good position to kind of take on the challenge. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't easy, but we got through it. Right. How does that, how does that change or, or not change uh, your, your mindset in terms of supply chain, distribution, distribution center, and also manufacturing sources? Um, I know there's a lot of talk from different companies of reshoring their manufacturing capability. Uh, is that something you guys are thinking about as well? Yeah, so it's definitely something we thought about pre-pandemic. Uh, I think the pandemic accelerated that mindset where, you know, mm -hmm. historically we were heavily uh, centered in Asia, you know, specifically Taiwan and China. And it's still the bulk of our purchases, but there are opportunities outside of, of China and, and Taiwan. So we are making deals in, we're making deals in Korea, we're making deals in Mexico, we're making deals in, in India. So, you know, there's a lot of, of great talent and great factories out there. Our business is growing exponentially. So we're in a position that we can kind of pick and choose and, and find the best partners. Um, but yeah, it's always about diversification and, and risk management. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, and a lot of e-commerce or commerce business in general are now trying to think of a balance uh, of online and physical stores, whether it's wholesaling or opening up their own physical stores. Is that within uh, the aspiration you know, uh, of carparts.com as well? 
I, I think we're an online company first and our customers are pri you know, primarily online you know, DIY or, or DIFM shoppers. I think we have a lot to accomplish and a lot to do on the e-commerce side. You know, historically, auto parts is highly underpenetrated. So if you look at mm -hmm. furniture or pet foods, like 15, 20, 25% of the purchases are made online. Now for auto parts, it's less than 5%. Now we're a big piece of that, but we still have a lot of room to grow. And that online penetration is accelerating. So you have more cars on the road and you have more purchases being made online. And I think we're also leading uh, because we're offering a new solution that allows the customer to find the parts they need and buy it online, which historically was difficult to find. Right, right, okay. And now going, going a little bit about uh, Seeker uh, on the, uh, the Texas Distribution Center you have mentioned, I think it's really, this is very exciting. Uh, to me, also, I had some supply chain experience, so uh, geeked out on, on this type of stuff. But uh, so, once again, like it, it sounds like you guys recently opened a, opened a distribution, distri I'm sorry, distribution center in Grand Prairie, Texas. Um, why did you decide to open a distribution center there? So, you know, we decided, I think we decided, like, my first week on the job, we decided we're going to open more distribution centers. So, you okay. know, we, we like to think that inventory is our oxygen. And the more inventory we can have, the more opportunities we have to sell it to the customers. But speed of delivery and inventory availability are, are key. So you can't sell what you don't have in stock. And sometimes the customer doesn't want to wait. So having DCs close to the customer has always been part of the strategy. And so the way we approached it is, you know, we had one DC in the, in the Midwest, one DC in the East Coast. And we said, hey, we got to be on the West Coast. So let's open Vegas. We got to be in the South. Let's open Texas. And then over the next you know, 12 to 24 months, you can expect us to open more DCs to get closer to the customer. Again, the vision is how do we deliver our products to 80% of our customers within one day? And the only way to do that is to be closer to that customer. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I, I know a lot of companies also right now are utilizing sort of a outsource 3PLs yeah. into different distribution center. Is that, um, is that something you guys are also considering? Or it's more so you're trying to make sure that this is your uh, a company owned distribution center? So it's, it's interesting you ask because that question comes up a lot in all aspects of our business. Like, do you want to own it or do you want to outsource it? And what we decided is anything that is a core competencies, anything that is going to separate us from the competition, anything that allows us to get to our, our next checkpoint, like how do we build a multi billion dollar business? has to be controlled in-house. Technology has to be in-house. Marketing, in-house. Customer experience, in-house. Data and catalog, in-house. Supply chain, because we are also a supply chain company, has to be in-house. Our buildings, our people, our process, our inventory. I like that. I like that. Uh, it sounds like definitely it's part of the culture, even from day one, the, the discipline of it and the vision. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. I, I think for, for some people out there, perhaps they're not as familiar with supply chain and what does, the, what does a good distribution center look like? Could you give a little bit uh, more you know, information, perhaps just give an example of the one in Texas. What does that look like? What does it do? Who works there day to day? I think what's important is that a good distribution center first has to align with the overall mission and the strategy of, of the company. So you know, we talk about service levels or SLAs. How quickly does a part need to get out of the DC? If it's e-commerce, it's really quickly. If it's B2B, maybe it's not as quick. So first is figuring out who the customer is. For us, it's mostly single pick, pack, and ship. So most of our customers buy one, two, or three parts. They don't buy full pallets. So setting up the distribution center in a way that allows for efficient picking and packing. Now, as far as the people that you find in there, uh, number one is someone in charge of safety. Like safety is the number one priority. So we have, call it in our Texas facility, for example, we have 200 people working there. Keeping those people safe is number one priority. After that, you have some, some kind of infrastructure, IT, uh, HR, recruiting. Uh, but the bulk of the people, it's the core of our business. It's the people that make carparts.com run. It's the people that unload the containers, that put them away on the shelves, pick, pack, and ship, and make sure that you know, the box is nice and clean and square and it goes out of the DC as quickly as possible. So the core of our business are those people. That's who I work for, not the other way around. Right, right. And, and so I, I think that kind of reminded me of a recent, uh, another big e-commerce company, perhaps you 
you know, that starts with an A. Um, they have had some, you know, uh, uh, sort of voting on, on the unionizing of the labor yeah. force, the distribution center. And, and they're, you know, I think this is widely known, like uh, the culture is very disciplined. Um, it's not for everyone. How does that, when you look at a situation like that, and also the way you just mentioned, you look at yourself, you work for these people that work in the warehouses. Can you share a little bit about some of the practices that you guys uh, put in place when it comes to employ, employees at the, uh, at the distribution center? Yeah, I think for us, it's, it's, it's twofold. Number one, it's over communication, but it's on both sides. So we make it a point to spend as much time as we can in the DCs. Again, this month I was uh, in our Dallas facility twice. Uh, you know, pre-COVID, I used to spend a lot more time because traveling was easier. You know, going to our LaSalle facility once a quarter, going to our Virginia DC, driving up to Vegas. So it's being there. Uh, number one, to listen. So a lot of times I'll go there and I want to see and I want to hear. I want people to come up to me. So I don't spend time behind an office looking at spreadsheets. I spend time on the floor and I make it a point to go and talk to every single person because there are excellent people there, great ideas and a lot of opportunities. And I find that by just being there, most people will come up to me and say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? This happened again, like last week. It's like, hey, can we make this bigger? Can we make this smaller? This process doesn't work. This process works. So, you know, I can't, I can't solve every problem. And I never promise that, hey, I'm going to go back to the office and solve all of your problems. But what I can promise is I'm going to listen and I'm going to see if I can do something and if it makes sense. So, you know, obviously we run a tight ship, but I think being there for our people and having uh, someone to talk to is critical. So, Again, it's not rocket science. And you know, for Amazon, it's probably a lot more complicated than it is for me. I have five distribution centers and I make it a point to go visit them and, and being available. And, and hopefully that's enough. Uh, but you know, we could always do better for sure. Sounds like communication transparency, uh, kind of like the high level idea of what, what you're talking about. Um, so the distribution, the distribution center is projected to create a minimum of, you know, like I mentioned, 150 new jobs. I think it's it surpassed that at this point and $10 million in economic impact in the first 18 months. Um, can you speak about whether or not this is still on track and how do you envision the distribution center to impact the city's economy itself locally? So we like to under promise and over deliver. So uh, we've already exceeded those numbers uh, in the first 12 months. So we've been operational for you know really nine months. We've created over 200 jobs. We have a whole veterans initiative and close to 10% of our employees there are, are United States Army or Navy or Marine veterans. So uh, that's a big deal. Um, and uh, we've created more than $10 million economic impact, both in terms of jobs and payroll taxes and city taxes and state taxes. You know, Texas is a big state for us. So every time we ship to Texas, it generates income from the city. But I got to tell you, I work with a lot of different municipalities and the city of Grand Prairie has been incredible to work with. Uh, really a fantastic group of people. When we opened the distribution center uh, at the same time, Pier 1 Imports was going through a, a difficult time. They were in the process of going through bankruptcy and we were able to recruit a lot of their people. Uh, mm -hmm. We started at the, the top. So we hired the HR manager for Pier 1, Pier 1 Imports and said like, hey, anyone who needs a job, let's start interviewing them. And if we can bring in some people that need a job, like let's do it. Uh, so we had the combination of Pier 1 Imports uh, military recruiting, and then and just the local, the local workforce. So overall, it's been a huge success and we're lucky to be there. That's great. Um, let's go into a little bit about your leadership style. Uh, you had mentioned that you don't like to talk about anything personal, but uh, <laughs> I think it would be really valuable, um, you know, since we, we have a lot of sort of founders and business leaders uh, within alumni group. So they love to kind of learn what other, other successful entrepreneurs are doing and get some best practices as well. So as a leader at this point, what, what keeps you up at night? I, I, you know, there's a lot of different things that keep me up at, time, keep me up at night. But I think the number one thing is the safety of our employees. Uh, you know, I'm responsible for thousands of people. Uh, today we have 2,000 people uh, in our corporate office, in our distribution centers, in our Manila office, in India, uh, we have offices across the world and, you know, COVID is not done. I think we've done a pretty good job in California on the rollout of the vaccine. Uh, but, you know, it's not the case everywhere. So I think the safety of our people is really what keeps me up at night. 
Um, having said that, you know, I'm hopeful and thankful of everything that's going on and things are getting better and our people are going to get safer and safer. Yeah, that's great. I think one thing about supply chain uh, a lot of people talk about, which is the balance of automation and also people. Um, as you open up more distribution centers, obviously you're, you're, you're going to have to hire more people. How do you balance uh, or, or juxtapose that balance of you know, automating certain services versus hiring more people? Yeah, listen, it, it's, it's an investment decision and sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, what we found is as the business was growing exponentially, we could go faster and get a better ROI in doing non-automated DCs. So obviously we have some semi-automations, we have some sorting and sorting equipment, we have uh, conveyor belts, but ultimately if, if we can't get the immediate ROI, we've done it manual. Um, but having said that, as we roll out more and more DCs, automation is becoming more and more of an opportunity if we have more time to prepare. Yeah. You know, when, when, we, when we launch a DC, it takes three to six months for us to, to be up and running. Uh, automation takes longer. So there's a time component. Sure, okay, that sounds good. Um, going forward, where do you see the car parts going in the next, let's just say 12 to 24 months? We're gonna grow, <laughs> we're gonna grow. Uh, you know, what we're doing is we're building the number one destination for people to solve their car problems. We think that sol fixing your car, getting back on the road creates anxiety. There's no price transparency. There's not a lot of information out there and giving the consumer the tools and the options to fix their car on their own. So you come to our website, you put in your year, make and model. If you know what's wrong with your car, we can give you the tools and information that you need if you can't, we can send you to a shop. So ultimately it's uh, thinking about that customer, like what do they need? They wanna get back on the road. How do we deliver that solution? And how do we become the number one destination? If you have a problem with your car, whether you know what the problem is or you don't, whether you can diagnose it yourself or you can't, I want you to be able to thank carparts.com and it's our job to deliver that solution. All right, that's great. Um... As a leader, and now you've been a leader in various companies, do you have any leadership sort of lesson or principle that you go by? Yes, I have, uh, I have leadership principles that I go by. They're not, uh, I don't recommend them for everyone, but I live by three leadership principles. Wake up early, get after it, and don't quit. That's the story okay. of my life. That's anyone who works with us, like, this is how I think. So, it's a lot of energy, it's, it's default mode is aggressive. So we like to say that we wanna crush the enemy. We always know that there is someone out there that is bigger, better funded, more experience, more resources, more scale, and we wanna go after them. Uh, we've been lucky that today, we're the fastest growing retailer in the space, but it doesn't mean that we're gonna be that retailer uh, forever, and we gotta keep fighting. So uh, we think of like running a company, is, it's a contact sport, and to do that, you got to be prepared. You got to wake up early, get after it, and never quit. Right, right. That's good. Um, and, and also culturally, so I think there's a lot of founders and leaders that in order to grow, they they have to hire the right people. How do you uh, sort of translate that, or look for the leaders that you're looking for with the type of mindset that you have uh, through interview? Are there certain things that you look for, or certain questions you ask? Yeah, I mean, our 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 um, our interview process it's it's pretty rigorous. Uh, I will say it's not easy to get a job with us because we have high standards. Um, you know, we believe in extreme ownership. We believe in people who come in and take charge, people that are aggressive, uh, not afraid to get their hands dirty. It doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or a coordinator, you're gonna get your hands dirty, you're gonna service the customer and you're gonna get after it. And we're looking for that mindset. Now, having said that, we also look for technical experts and part of our interview process requires you to showcase your technical skills. So. For me, I'm more of a generalist, but I have an army of technical experts, uh, data science, inventory forecasting, sourcing, supply chain. So we wanna look for people that have done it before, done it successfully, but can also do that in an environment that's fast paced, high pressure uh, around discipline, excellence, and customer experience. Yeah, I think I just tee it up. So for anybody who qualifies, um, you can send David an email later. Uh, Absolutely, <laughs> and, and you can reach me on Twitter and send me your resumes and, if you think you qualify and you can make it here, absolutely. We're always looking for good talent. Obviously, I have a soft spot for, uh, for USC. Uh, we have three guys on our executive team that are from USC and, and way more at all the levels of the organization. 
uh, great school, great people, but that gets you the, that gets you uh, us looking at your resume. After that, you got to prove yourself. Right. Absolutely. Um, at this point, do you have any advice for our audience who are entrepreneurs or aspire to be entrepreneurs? I, I'm not big on giving advice. I, I'm a big believer on doing what works for me. Uh, you know, the, the mindset that works for me may not work for everyone. I think, you know, waking up early, getting after it, having that mindset of, hey, I'm going out there to serve the customer, but also crushing the competition. Like, it's a contact sport. It's not easy. There's people coming for your lunch every day, and it's a fight. So th that's my mindset. I, I think to be successful in any industry, you need a little bit of that. You know, maybe I over-index in that, uh, that aggressiveness, but uh, I, I think it's important. But it's working out well for you. So it's just, uh, like you said, but it, it works well for your business. Uh, it's good to hear. Um, so yeah, that was all the questions I have. Now I'm going to go to Q&A. Um, so first question uh, from Ealing10. Um, Ealing mentioned, uh, with the push and demand for, electric, for EVs, with less parts in EVs, how does this affect your company and what is your future plan in the world as there's more electric vehicles out, out on the street? Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually a misconception. You know, if you look at our business, 90% of our, uh, of our sales are agnostic to the powertrain. So regardless of whether the car is combustion engine, EV or hybrid, 90% of our parts overlap. You know, you still need shocks and struts and control arms and lights, mirrors, uh, but Knowing that the car park is going to change, we think that the companies that are going to win over the next 10 to 15 years have to make investments today. Uh, so it's actually been one of our big initiatives this year. Uh, we launched a, a dedicated uh, online portal. So it's carparts.com slash EV, uh, where we provide you the tools, the information, and the parts to fix EVs and hybrids. And we're making those investments today. Now, obviously, there's not a lot of EVs and hybrids on the road today. It's 1% to 2%. But over time, that number will increase and we have to make those investments today. So it's a great question. Yeah, great. Next question from Glenn Dixon. Uh, Glenn said, do you find your business is growing more in the DIY space or the professional repair sector? Yeah, so right now it is growing more in the DIY space because we are historically a DIY company. Uh, that's how we were built and that's the customer that we service. Now, over time, we want to be agnostic as to how the customer fixes their car. So whether uh, they need help with diagnostic, whether they can do the work themselves, or whether they need a shop to do it, uh, we want to be that destination. And the other thing to think about is, depending on the job, some customers can be DIY, and sometimes they can be DIFM. So you may be able to fix you know, your mirror, your headlight, or your bumper cover, because these are easy jobs. Uh, if you start getting into steering and suspension, you may need a shop to help you. So over time, uh, some of the investments that we're making right now is to go after the do it for me market. Got it. And this, this question is actually more of a follow up for me as well. Um, as you think about your business right now, there's a lot of direct consumer. Um, are you also thinking about sort of the bulk wholesaling into other channels as well? We absolutely are. Uh, it's a small part of our business right now. It's about 5%. Uh, it requires uh, sometimes a different inventory and a different process. Uh, but we started to build the team last year, and that team is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so over time, we think that you know, the shop business, the wholesale business, B2B, is going to be a bigger part of, of the company, for sure. It's a big opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question from Christina Denning. Uh, as the business continues to grow exponentially, how do you describe the company culture to employees? Yeah, I think that's, that's really the critical thing that we have to figure out. Uh, as a management team, you know, last year we hired 800 people. Um, so when I, when I joined the company two years ago, I made it a point and, and Lev, my partner in crime, uh, made it a point to, to meet every single person that works uh, with us, uh, regardless of the location. So whether it's Taiwan or it's Philippines or one of our distribution centers. And, and there are a lot of people that work for the company that I haven't met. So, you know, how do you translate that culture? I think it's, it's really, it's, it's a trickling down effect. Like I, I try to envision the culture that I want to build and the people that we work for me, the VPs and the directors, hopefully they reflect and they have that same mindset and it trickles down one layer and one layer. Ultimately, I have a vision for the culture, but I can't control it. We have 2000 people. They decide what the culture is. You know, we focus on the vision, 
we focus on the overarching strategy, which is service the customer, and then having that mindset of operational excellence, financial discipline, and hopefully it, it trickles down. But I think that's the challenge for any fast moving startup. And we also see ourselves as a startup. Like how do you, how do you convey and how do you push that culture? You can't really push a culture down people's throat. They have to embody it and they have to build the culture themselves. Have you been able to see as you sort of grow, you know, so, so fast in such a short time, have you seen the culture shifted or the way that it's morphed um, throughout the, I, I would say the past 24 months, for example? Yeah, the, the culture of the company has changed. Yes, over the last two years, you know, we've brought in a lot of people, we've made a lot of investments and, and, and the company has grown. And I think it's shifted and, and grown for the better. Um, but, you know, there is like, you know, COVID has had an impact. Like I don't get to interact with as many people face-to-face -face as I used to. And I'm looking forward to the day where everyone comes back into the office and we can have those face-to-face -face conversations. So, you know, I, I think our people are resilient. Our people got after it. Uh, we delivered outstanding results for our teams, our shareholders, our employees. So, you know, could we have done better if it, if it hadn't been for COVID? Who knows? But I'm pretty proud of, of the culture that we've built and how resilient our people have been during the, the pandemic. Okay. Next question. I think you kind of touched upon it a little bit, but um, it's asking, do you have any intention to move the manufacturing from Asia to, to the U.S.? We have, uh, we're diversifying for sure. So there are specific parts and categories that we are starting to source in the United States. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, next one's probably a little bit more fun, more USC driven. Um, how has USC shaped who you are as a leader and entrepreneur today? So I think it's shaped, uh, it's shaped my professional career, at least a lot. You know, all my friends from USC are still my friends, whether it's grad, graduate school or undergrad. Uh, you know, Lev, who's the CEO of the company and been my friend for 20 years, is the one who called me two years ago and said, hey, let's do this together. Uh, we have another guy on the executive team, Ryan Lockwood, uh, was a USC alum, one of my best friends. So we did both graduate school and undergrad. So, you know, my team is, is USC driven. Uh, my friends are USC driven. So I think the Trojan family, like I embody it for sure. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to going back to the football games in person. One hundred percent, absolutely. Feeling that energy, I'm sure a lot of children feel the same way. Um, and let me see. There's a question that just came in. Uh, and this is a little bit more tactical. So, in terms of marketing, in a world like car parts, um, what what's been a sort of interesting find? Um, is it more social media, SEO, or is it more traditional type of marketing? Yeah, I think there's two things that we do differently um, on the marketing side. Number one is, like you mentioned, there's different channels, right? You got direct mm -hmm. SEO, email, affiliate, social. And a lot of times it's important to look at marketing as a whole. Uh, but sometimes one channel can be very profitable and a channel unprofitable. And you use the profitable channel to subsidize you know, mistakes or unprofitable channels. What we try to do is optimize each channel separately and individually to make sure that each channel is profitable on its own. That's number one. And number two, a lot of marketing budgets are based in um, or built in percentages of sales. Hey, what's your marketing budget? What's 12% uh, of sales? And as my sales grow, I can only, I'm, I'm capping myself. What we do is we maximize net profits after marketing spend. So it doesn't matter what your marketing spend is as a percentage of sales, as long as you're generating incremental dollars, we're willing to acquire customers. And we make it a point that every customer transaction that we have on the website is a profitable one. We want positive unit economics at the transaction level from the first transaction. That's a key differentiator between our business and a lot of other online companies. Right, so you guys definitely run a, run a lean and you make sure that it's profitable every dollar you spend. Financial discipline. Okay. Right, that's fantastic. Uh, that's great. So uh, another question came in from uh, Ealing. Um, you, said, you mentioned that if a customer doesn't know a specific part, you will send them to a shop. Is there an agreement between the company and the workshop to facilitate that transaction? Um, and does this help in capturing a bigger market B2B? I think you kind of mentioned that a little bit. We are working on it. And does it help okay. capture a bigger piece of the pie? Absolutely. So it's a work in progress. Again, historically, we've been kind of DIY centric and now we're becoming more agnostic. But 
for sure a big opportunity. Right. Okay. Next question. Um, are there any learnings that you have had so far that you wish you knew before you enter this industry? Um, I, 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 you know, I didn't learn anything new, but what I did confirmed everything I had learned over the last 15 years, which is, again, we talked about the first one, which is everything that matters happens on the floor, whether it's the DC okay. or the office. And number two, it's all about the team. You know, I, I like to say that I don't do anything. My job is to hire the best people, the best technical experts that I can find and let them do what they do. My job is to empower them to execute on the roadmap, execute on the vision, give them the resources and the support to execute and, and get out of the way. My job is not to do handholding or micromanagement. So again, it's all about mm -hmm. the team. When you, when you were saying, you know, you, you, you walk on the floor quite a bit and you really get into understanding the customers, do you require your functional leaders to do the same thing? It's, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, we're, actually working on, uh, we're actually working on an initiative for all the executive team to go and spend some time in the DCs and also over okay. the phone the unload containers, a uh, pick and pack and, and see what's out there. Like what is it? What's the business that we're in? The business is not looking at spreadsheets. The business is packing and shipping boxes to the customer. Um, and it's important that everyone on the executive team kind of uh, understands that. So I've packed my share of boxes many, many times. Uh, it's a great experience and you get to see and, and live what our people live. And to the same token, like talking to our customers on the phone, understanding our pain points, like, hey, why are you calling? How can I help? And then thinking about how we can deliver a great customer experience and you go back to work and then you work on it. And hopefully next time you come back and talk to a customer, it's a better experience. Right, that's fantastic, that makes sense. Uh, last question, more of a fun, fun like question from me. Um, what is the best purchase you've done in the past 12 months that's under $100? Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> um, my first, my gut reaction would be a book. So how about this? I'll give you two. One is a $1 item, which is a little string. It's a black string because I only wear black. A black string to hold my mask. So I used to always forget my mask. So now I have a string around my neck and I always carry my mask no matter where I go. So I never forget it. So that's $1, great purchase. Uh, and number two, a book. Um, so one of the books that uh, I've read many times is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Uh, there was uh, a new yeah. translation that came out by Gregory Hayes and I reread it and I got a lot more out of it than the first time. So same book, different translation. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. And just a lot of lessons that I can, I can use and, and, and take in, in my day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I have the Marcus Aurelius copy actually. So I, I need to check out the new, the new Gregory Hayes is the new translation. I think it's $22. So I answered your question with 22 plus one, $23. <laughs> That's financial discipline right there. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're gonna conclude our session here. And thank you so much, David, for coming back and sharing all this knowledge. I mean, it's very impressive what you've done with the business. And I wish you and the business a lot going forward and continue to grow. Thank you, Dennis. And again, want to thank USC for the amazing experience. All my friends, my professional career was driven by my relationships at USC, the USC Alumni Association, Danielle, everyone behind the scene for putting together this event. It's been fantastic and it was great to be back. Yeah, thank you. Fight on.